The regular season ended with a wild, action-filled Sunday, and we have ESPN's Alexa Philippou here to break everything down. You are locked on women's basketball. Let's go. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yes, hello, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day here as part of the Locked On Podcast Network. We want to remind you that Locked On Women's Basketball is available for free anywhere you get your podcasts and on YouTube. I'm Alex Simon, filling in for Howard Magdal here. I'm from Bay Area News Group, and we have Alexa Philip who joining us from Connecticut from ESPN. Alexa, an interesting day to be in Connecticut yesterday because you got to be at the final game of Sylvia Fowles' WNBA career just just what was that experience like yeah it was I think it's something I'll probably remember forever because it's not like every day you're covering the last game of a legend like that um especially when it's in the regular season and it's kind of this anticlimactic disappointing end I think even um non-Lynx fans um were kind of hoping that um maybe they would have pulled out the win and gotten some help and seen Sylvia Fowles play again in the playoffs but it was a very emotional day I think in general um you could tell kind of before the game it looks like Syl was just kind of like taking it all in and like you know her teammates are trying to like keep things loose at times too because they're obviously trying to get a playoff spot at the same time wasn't just about extending her career but you know they got basically blown out by the sun most of the game they made a late run to make it interesting in the fourth but they just you know once the sun starters went back in then there was kind of um, they kind of took control. So um, definitely an emotional post game to see kind of Cheryl Reeve and still have that really long embrace on the sideline when she checked out for the last time. And, um, you know, the Mohegan Sun crowd gets it. They gave her a, a really huge standing ovation and the Sun players, you know, they were, I think they, they were steps that sounds really aggressive. It wasn't really, like, you know, not aggressive. It just sounds really like, oh my God, like she's dead, but she's not. No, they were just kind of going up and um, you know, congratulating her and giving her their well wishes before and after the game too. So, um, you know, it was it was a good celebration for her. Um, even though she, I think what was most classic still that I um, that I picked up on was that apparently she said like when in the moment she was like thanking all her teammates as she went on the bench, she was just like. I played shitty and I'm disappointed that I, I did them a disservice. I didn't, you know, help them win enough because she only had three points th through three quarters. So that just felt very classic. So where in that moment, that was so much about her. She was still thinking about what she could do for her teammates. And um, I think that really epitomizes who she is. And you all can read Alexa's story from the game on ESPN.com. And if you want to get the shortcut even better, ESPN.com slash WNBA. Um, I do think it's fitting, though, that at least for a player who is – studied for a while to be a mortician that sometimes you know there's the end of a career comes sooner than you think and this minnesota season has truly been a little bit wild and chaotic and nobody knew what was happening all of a sudden players who we thought were going to be on this team that were key offseason additions were gone after even a few games like angel mccotry or very quickly throughout the season they had roster fluidity and it's kind of life in the WNBA where even if you're not necessarily what i'd call a good team you still have a shot at making the playoffs. And yesterday, two of the teams that I wouldn't necessarily say I think are world-beating teams, but the last two playoff spots went to the New York Liberty and Phoenix Mercury, teams who were horrendous for the beginning of the season. I think the Liberty, I'll say horrendous so you don't have to, uh, but the Liberty started 1-7, and seven, the Mercury 2-8. and eight. It, it looked all sorts of bad for both, but each has kind of picked it up down the stretch here. And even though the Mercury finished the second half of the season going nine and nine in the WNBA, that's good enough to make the playoffs. And now you kind of just wonder, especially with New York, could they be a team that maybe scare some people in the postseason? I have more faith that New York could scare um, Chicago than Phoenix could scare the Aces. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to grapple with everything that's happened in Phoenix the last few weeks. The fact that they still ended up getting into the playoffs with, uh, you know, the recent events 
we can say, because there's just a lot to go uh, through there, um, is quite something. Um, I definitely did not expect them to make the playoffs. I think even once Tina Charles left um, back then, I was like, oh, yeah, they're they're done. So I think in some ways, credit to the players who were still playing and credit, play, credit to the players that um, were healthy or there um, and did enough to win um, and to Vanessa Nygaard because, you know, they could have totally had like a Sparks kind of trajectory where they just like lost nine of their last 10 games or whatever L.A. did. Um, but yeah, New York, I think is the sort of team where if they get hot, then yeah, they're really dangerous to face, especially with their three point shooting. So I'm really intrigued. I actually am on the record on our predictions that I think they could take one against Chicago. I do think Chicago ends up winning that series, but I just don't think you should count out, uh, the Liberty totally. Um, they can be inconsistent, but especially when you have like a player like Sabrina Unescu on, on your team and you have somebody um, really interesting integral pieces around her that when they're all working and gelling together, they're a really, um, really tough team to go up against. I did take a look at the predictions that yourself and Vopal Kevin Pelton put on uh, ESPN.com. I want to come back to those before you go okay. today. Uh, okay. But I do think, especially with the new playoff format, it makes it super interesting and adds a little bit of chaos because if you are a top seed, you get two games at home. So you can just, if you take care of your business on your home floor, then, you know, we wipe the, wipe your hands clean, get ready for the next round. If not, that game three is back at the lower seeds floor. So uh, I, I'll, let me bring it up now. You, I noticed you had three of the higher seeds going to a third game, but winning the series. Um, yeah. You mentioned New York, but you also had Connecticut, Dallas going three games, Seattle, Washington going three games, but you had all of the higher seeds winning that third game. I find that interesting. If the lower seed forces a home game, does that give them a little bit of that little bump? And you seem to think, nah, I like, I like the higher seeds still. Yeah. So I think my thought process is that in those games, the match the matchups can be competitive enough where the lower seed can get one game. But I still think like Chicago, Connecticut and Seattle are the better teams where they're going to end up winning the road game. I, I could the D.C. Uh, Seattle series, I could totally see that going the other way than I predicted, but it just was like really hard to pick against like, you know, like super like advancing to the semifinals. I just was like, I can't see that happening um, in that sort of situation. But I do think Dallas is a tough matchup for Connecticut. Um, I do think Connecticut has, I think the way I explained it in the article was like Connecticut has the playoff experience where they're going to be able to, they could, I think, I could very easily see them getting that road win if it does go to a game three. Uh, the Wings have never won a playoff game before, the whole entire franchise, since it's moved to Dallas. So, um, and, you know, they, I know they played, you know, some good games with Adarike. They've had a little bit of a drop off, and then I guess they crushed the Sparks yesterday. But, um, you know, this will be a good test well, for them. So. I, I would say they crushed the shell of the Sparks that are still playing basketball, but uh, that's just that's me. Fair. I will say this, Kurt Miller, as he proved yesterday when he became maybe public enemy number one on WNBA Twitter by bringing the starters back in, he does not care what you think. He wants to go for the playoffs. This is a team that has came within a game of winning a WNBA title and has been maybe the most consistent team in the WNBA over the past five years in terms of year in and year out capabilities, no matter who they have on their team and how healthy they are. But um, I do think Dallas has been looking a lot sharper without Arike. I wonder if they've maybe been able to find a little more cohesion offensively without her at the moment. And so they'll get tested with a very good inside defensive Connecticut team. What, um, because you were there though, for this last game in Minnesota, the finality of that also brings the off season for them and the other three teams who haven't made the playoffs. Is there maybe a team that you feel like out of those four kind of faces the best road ahead in terms of Minnesota, Atlanta, LA, and Indiana, who unfortunately mm -hmm. for them did not finish the case. They finished the season on an 18 game losing streak, which oof. Yeah, well, just to kind of go through them all a little bit briefly, I think 
I'm interesting. I'm interested to see what happens in Indiana with the whole interim head coach, um, interim GM situation. Um, is Lincoln Dunn going to stay? Um, what about Carlos Knox? I do think in general, there's reason to be, you know, optimistic because of the talent they brought in from the draft is like really promising. So I do think that they're on a promising trajectory, but still important decisions to be made in terms of um, leadership. The dream, I mean, they were so close to making the playoffs and they had so many players either like injured or Tiffany Hayes just going overseas um, last minute from our perspective um, at the end of the season. So I do feel like if they were, if they had had a little bit better health luck or just like people, their luck, personnel luck, I think they probably would have made the playoffs. Um, but I think that they're looking in great shape, too, given um, all the changes we've seen in the last two years. Um, Tanisha Wright, very deserving coach of the year bid. Um, and Dan Padover knows what he's doing in the front office, too. Um, and then you have Ryan Howard, and you're going to be able to get another lottery pick, too. So that could be really um, beneficial um, in terms of what they can build upon last year and this year's draft. Um, Minnesota, I mean, you have Cheryl Reeve at the end of the day. Um, she's a proven GM that... Uh, knows how to build championship teams um, this year, obviously did not go to plan, but um, I'm very curious to see what their off season looks like. Cause they have some really important, um, interesting decisions to make, um, you know, how they're going to build um, with that lottery pick and what that's going to look like. And kind of if you're officially now done that kind of dynasty of the, the four titles with Sills re retirement since she was the last one remaining from, from those teams um, that won championship. So um, what are they going to look like moving forward? But again, you still have good pieces to move around. And then the one I, I have the most questions about is the Sparks, because they um, obviously are, well, assuming that Washington takes their pick um, officially, which I, I think someone tweeted like, so how does that actually work? Does like Mike Tebow have to like give a firm answer to someone? Like, I can just imagine him like cackling on the phone. Like, yes, you could, see, could Mike Tebow just be like, actually, I'm good at eight guys. I don't need to swap into the lottery. I'll be okay. I've done fine right. down there. Right. Yeah. So I, I do think they, they have, a, they, I mean, again, yeah, it's a similar situation to the Indiana fever, but still like even more questions because they have so many free agents. Uh, I think Neka Ogumake has made it sound like she wants to stay in LA, um, but pretty much some, the majority of their major contributors um, outside of their like young core are free agents. So who's going to come back? Um, who's going to be the coach? Who's going to be the GM? Um, there's so many questions there. So that's the team I have the most questions about, and I, I have no idea what they're going to look like in 2023. And and I'm going to actually spend quite a bit of time here talking about L.A. once we get done. I know you have to go very soon. So the last thing I want to ask you is kind of taking it back to where we started, where you were in this locker room yesterday with covering Minnesota. And I found it very interesting to read that Cheryl Reeve, the coach for the Lynx, kind of was saying that, like, if if Sill were anybody else, maybe there would be more annoyance. Maybe there would be this. And to kind of have this happen, just like what what was the feeling from Cheryl in particular as kind of coach GM of this player who she's had from multiple championship runs now knowing this is it with her? Yeah, no, she um, she was so emotional uh, about everything. Um, she was post game. We were in this very small, intimate room in Mohegan Sun Arena. Um, and obviously everyone's processing things differently, but she was just kind of choking back tears at various points of the conversation. Um, she said life without still is going to suck. Um, you know, she kind of poked fun at her. Like, I'm sure, you know, she's going to miss me doing whatever. And I'm going to miss her kind of giving me the side eye sort of thing. Um, Cause I'm sure they had their, you know, little moments throughout their career, um, her career like that. But um, yes, Cheryl knows what still has meant to not just the franchise, but the game of basketball. And that's not lost on her. And I thought what was what was just really interesting and um, something that stood out to me was how she said Sill could have been pissy about how the season went because it did not go to plan at all for the Lynx. Um, it was basically the opposite of a last season that you'd probably want um, for a legend like Sill. But um, from everything Cheryl said, Sill, and I think everything that we've all seen, Sill handled it with grace and poise. Um, and then you know, we were like the broader women's basketball world was able to able to kind of honor her in ways that um, she hadn't really been honored throughout her career. So um, I'm not sure I don't want to speak for 
the people involved, but it seemed like there was a little bit of um, maybe closure kind of approaching in because there was it was this whole season long celebration of Sill. So even though the postseason, um, you know, won't have the links in it, won't have some of fouls in it, um, we all not we, but, you know, the broader women's basketball world got to say goodbye in their own way. And still was able to enjoy that. And um, Cheryl was able to see that, too. So, um, yeah, it was a very emotional day, though, for sure. We definitely, as the women's basketball world, will get to miss Sylvia Fowles here. We will not get to miss any of your coverage, though. Alexa, thanks for taking the time out this morning to join us here on Locked On Women's Basketball. We will be sure to see everything. Follow Alexa at Alexa Philippu. That's P-H-I-L-I-P-P-O-U on Twitter and see everything she does on, I don't know, like every platform ESPN ever has. I swear I see you on a new one every day. Thanks for joining us, Alexa. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. And folks, you know, if you kind of get to through your mornings and you've been sitting here hungry, thinking about all of the things that you need to do as you get your day started, I'm out on the West Coast right now. It is very early in the morning. The thing that I look for when I get to that point is Built Bar. It's a protein bar. It tastes like a candy bar, though. And you have it in all sorts of different flavors that allow you to feel like you're eating something wonderful while also eating something that's actually good for you. Um, if you go ahead and head to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code LOCK15, that's L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, you'll get 15% off your next order. Also, because you're listening to the Lockdown Women's Basketball Podcast, and I'm here filling in for Howard Mangel, make sure you tell them that Howard's mom, Grandma Myrna, sent you just to let them know who it is that's taking you to Built Bar. That's BuiltBar.com. Use the promo code LOCKEDON15, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-1-5. So as Alexa had to take off, I she mentioned the Los Angeles Sparks, and I found it absolutely fascinating to see what dropped over the weekend if you head over to our friends at Just Women's Sports, Rachel Galligan at Just Women's Sports did an anonymous poll where she talked to executives and PR representatives from around the WNBA. And I, I, there was so many things in this anonymous poll that came out. I believe it was on Thursday. They, yeah, so Rachel contacted 20 league personnel consisting of general managers, head coaches, assistant coaches, PR representatives from all 12 franchises. And the very last question in here that I found just absolutely incredible was which franchise has the biggest uphill battle after this 2022 season? And they had four different answers on this from these anonymous 20. The Fever, though, were the top team with nine. The Sparks had eight. The Mercury had two. And the Dream had one. And now don't get me wrong. I don't necessarily think the Indiana Fever are in the greatest of position going forwards. After all, they just finished a 5-31 and 31 season having lost 18 games in a row. I would not call that ideal. However, the Los Angeles Sparks have been an unmitigated disaster down the stretch here. And it has more to do not just with the people that they don't have, but the assets that they've traded away for the people they do have. I obviously understand that the Sparks recognized that something was wrong in what they did. They clearly fired Derek Fisher a third of the way into this season after Fisher, as the general manager and coach, has traded away their last two first-round draft picks in moves. Now, when they traded away a first-round draft pick last season, it was for a player in, I believe, the trade for Jasmine Walker, who unfortunately, and I, they certainly couldn't have predicted this, but Walker was injured at some point last season. And they, so apologies, they traded it once they got Jasmine Walker and gave up that pick to Dallas. Essentially, they made that move on draft day 2021 because they wanted Walker. They had the 10th pick. They took Stephanie Watts. So they traded a first round pick next year. They also got a first second round pick that year, which they ended up using. Um, but I, I just looked at that move. They got a second round pick in the 2022 draft. So they still ended up with more picks than they had. That 2022 second round pick ended up being Olivia Nelson Adota, who was very good for them, relatively speaking, this season. I think that is at least a positive sign for them going forward. They still have Jasmine Walker under contract for 2023 with an option year for 2024. You have all three years of their two first round picks from this year, Ray Burrell and Olivia Nelson Adota. But it is unquestionable to say that the way that the 
trade of the 2023 first round pick, which is now for the second straight year, a pick that ends up in the lottery that they have traded away to bring back Kennedy Carter, who interim head coach Fred Williams elected to not play for multiple games in a row here, only to then decide that he had a change of heart and play her down the stretch in the final games of the season. You just have to wonder what in the world is going on there. And then on top of that, you look at their roster situation, which Alexa mentioned, and they have unrestricted free agents for Neka Gumake, Christy Tolliver, who didn't play pretty much at all down the stretch, Tanea Gumake, Brittany Sykes, who is their best player and had a career high in this final game of the season. Jordan Canada is an unrestricted free agent after one season there. The only two players who are non-rookies or on rookie deals are Kennedy Carter, who is in the last year of her protected rookie deal, I should say, but she will be a protected rookie by that point. And Katie Lou Samuelson, who's making 130000 next year as a protected veteran. There's only five players currently under contract. They do have the reserve rights to Kiana Smith if they want to bring her back. But everything about this season, making the move to bring in Liz Cambage, which did not obviously work, they have now agreed to a contract divorce and Liz will no longer play there. Making the trade for Kennedy Carter, whose minutes fluctuated heavily throughout the season. Having all of these players as free agents, certainly it gives you the cap space to make moves to replace them, to kind of go off of what uh, Alexa was talking about when she mentioned the Sparks. It does sound as if NECA told the media after the game yesterday in Los Angeles that she is planning on returning. And if I go find the quote from our Dave Yapkowitz here at The Next who covers the Sparks, I believe I saw it was uh, Dave said that she NECA said this was like living in a house that you didn't build which is a very fascinating and interesting quote to get from her. And that next season they can build their own house now that they have the floor plans. And Neck is right. They certainly have moves to make next season, but she is somebody who will at least be tempted, I'm certain, by other teams around the league now that she no longer can be cored, to at least say, what are your other options? What other teams could you do? She may decide nothing at all. She may decide she just wants to hang out in Los Angeles and be good. I suspect it's not going to be more than a two-year deal. And so Los Angeles is going to have to build something that looks like a competent basketball team next season on the fly. Maybe even it's a one-year deal. And then it's really pushing the Sparks into a leadership position. They don't have anybody whatsoever that uh, you could argue is going to be an immediate contributor out of the five players they do have under contract next season. For example, Katie Lou Samuelson, who I thought has been all right for them this season, even if I wouldn't necessarily say she's been spectacular. Um, is that a player you really expect to be in your starting lineup for next season? I don't believe Katie Lou um, was a starter too frequently this season, but it looks like I might be mistaken there. And yes, yeah, she started most of their games this season, so I'm mistaken. There. But look, Katie Lou is somebody who for as much as she's a key contributor, is still only averaging in her career high this season 9.7 points a game and doing so in 29 minutes. I think Katie Lou's been solid for them. I have nothing against Katie Lou. I think she's a good pickup, but I would not necessarily build my team around Katie Lou. But as of right now, that's what they're going to have to do. And I think that would be the case here. Um, I, I just question when you look at where the fever are. And certainly, it is a terrible spot for the Fever to be in. 5-31 and 31 means, yeah, things went horrible. But they were doing it with intention. They built around five rookies. They ended up adding a sixth in the middle of the season. I just look at the Fever, and I at least see a plan in place. And the Los Angeles Sparks with no GM, an interim head coach. Fred Williams did say he wants to come back, but he's discussing coming. He said he was discussing coming back, and I just ask who is he discussing coming back with and should you be finalizing a move with a head coach before you have a GM filled out who then should be the one that decides the head coach you look at the Atlanta dream who I find it interesting that somebody gave them a single vote out of Rachel Galligan and just women's sports anonymous poll that they have a vote and the dream did this in the way that for as crazy as 2021 was in Atlanta they built this in the way that makes logical sense you hire a GM you let the GM help you get the coach. You make sure there's cohesion between the two, and you move forward from there. And that is the question the Los Angeles Sparks have to answer before you move on. As we kind of 
get to the end here and wrap up this day's episode, it, it's important, I think, to account for the teams that are not going to be in the playoffs because we have so much to look forward to in the playoffs, especially these expanded playoffs this season. We're going to have and longer rounds. So the three game first round is awesome. Everybody getting at least two games and not just playing a single elimination is there. And look, I think there is an immense amount of pressure on the higher seeds here because you know you can take care of business on your home floor, but if you slip up and give a game away in the playoffs, then that lower seeded team has just earned a trip to their house in the winner take all game three in the first round before you get to the five game semifinal. I think that's going to be a fascinating thing to see. We've definitely gone in quite a bit on this episode on two of the teams that did not make the playoffs. And I even think Indiana's there. For Atlanta, I, I truly think this ends up being a really solid situation for them. As much as, yes, the playoffs would have been a marvelous thing to achieve in the first year of them to kind of use them as the last team to talk about here. They still now, because of what their record was last season, have the second best lottery odds they even jump where la was they jump minnesota in there so they will have the second best shot when the lottery balls fall and the second most amount of lottery balls out of the ping pong balls at landing a potential difference maker in Aaliyah boston can you imagine next season the atlanta dream being able to roll out Aaliyah boston and ryan howard together that would be something obviously all four teams who are in the lottery i think are going to love the opportunity to get Aaliyah boston even if it meant that this season was a painful one and especially for teams that were as close to the playoffs as atlanta and minnesota certainly felt in this last week to be this close and to not be able to reach the playoffs is certainly something that they will rue however for the long-term build if you're atlanta being able to potentially add alia boston or whoever you would get in the lottery as well as having the eighth overall pick in a trade that we expect to happen with the pick swap that we mentioned earlier with Washington, that's a pretty good foundation to keep building around. If you're Indiana, you've got all of these rookies this year. You got an extra pick at the end of the first round from Chicago as part of the trade that brought you Bria Hartley for a portion of this season. You feel pretty confident. If you're the Washington Mystics who have Los Angeles's first round pick this season, you just made it into the playoffs and you're the one team that not only has a chance to win the WNBA title, but then add a first round top of the lottery pick. Yeah. I think you're happy about the opportunity there. And if you're the Minnesota Lynx, can you imagine just how perfect it would be to be able to go from Sylvia Fowles retiring to the lottery odds falling in your favor and replacing Sylvia Fowles with Aaliyah Boston and Aaliyah Boston getting to play her WNBA career and start it on the same home floor that she just won the national title on. That would be quite something. Thank you all for joining us on this Monday. We will be back tomorrow with a one of what will be many discussions about the actual WNBA playoffs that look deep into everything happening around the league and get you ready for what should be an absolutely brilliant month of the playoffs. I'm Alex Simon. You can follow me at Alex Simon Sports. I'm from Bay Area News Group. Make sure you check out The Next Tubes at The Next Tubes. We will have so much playoff coverage over at The Next. Looking at the eight teams, we'll even have coverage on the four that got eliminated. And oh, by the way, just don't forget here, we are getting ever closer to the start of college basketball season. Colleges are starting to get back to school now. We're going to have some amazing college work coming to you later in the fall and the winter. But before we do that, We've got playoffs to enjoy, and this is what it's all about. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a lovely Monday.